My name's Adele Onyango and welcome to another episode of Legally Clueless. No, seriously, I have no clue what I'm doing, but I'm pretty sure I'm not the only one. Hey you, welcome to episode 258. If you are an OG member of the family, thank you so much. I truly appreciate you. And if you're a newbie, welcome. Audio episodes like this go on every single Monday and you can find them everywhere you stream podcasts on. You can also find them on Trace Radio across East Africa. We're there on Monday and Wednesday at 1 p.m. and 11 p.m. and then on Fridays at 1 p.m. If you head over to our website, you can watch four seasons of our video series and our tour series as well, where we go across the world just recording some inspiring African stories. Our website is legallycluelessafrica.com. Last thing, when you're there, don't forget to sign up to join our family and receive our newsletter. Oh, not the last thing. The last thing is join our warm, cozy fuzzy corner of the internet because the internet is a cold place um on instagram we're at legally clueless africa links to all of what i've said are in the show notes so feel free to head over there and click away including a link to if you want to share your story the storyteller form fill it out and we'll get back to you all right back to this episode i'm really excited about the story that you're going to hear because the storyteller is oof I went in thinking it was going to be a story about just business and then it became business and something else. And I was just like, this is wonderful. So I'm excited to share it with you. Our storyteller's name is Tony. Listen to this. Talking about my childhood and being sent to approved schools when I was nine because my parents figured out that or believed that I was uh, indisciplined. ADHD and dyslexia are one other thing of that. Approved schools are basically, for those who don't know, high discipline and high army-like educational institutions and I spent a year there basically it beat the lights out of my life when I got out of that school thank god for moms she came to school one time and I had tattooed superman on my hand with a with a branch a small branch and a tw- or a twig and scraped the word superman for me to encourage myself to go through this pain that I was going to go through that I could do nothing about seeing my mom on, on, on a visiting day and as she leaves I cried and I walked past the teacher you're supposed to stand when a teacher is walking past and I walked past the teacher because I was looking down and I was trying to hide my tears. The teacher came into the staff room in such a kind fashion. I was thinking, oh, he's, he's going to, you know, console me or something. And, and slap me across the face so hard I, I couldn't hear on the left side for almost a month. That's coming up a little later in this episode. Right now, though, Song of the Week, which I feel I haven't shared with you for a minute. <laughs> anyway, so the song I'm really digging right now, I can't believe I actually dismissed. So it's off of the most recent album by Burner Boy, and the name of the song is On Form. Now, when that album first came out, I listened to the whole of it, and to be honest, I just felt like maybe this I, I wasn't connecting. And whenever that happens, I never trash an album, which a lot of people online do, which I'm like, if you don't like something, keep it moving. Why don't you share more of what you like? Anyway, so I just thought it's a me thing, which most of the times it is. If you don't connect with a song or a movie or something that's been released it doesn't make the thing shit if you don't connect with it it's just like oh it's not for me keep it moving so that's what I thought about this album and then I left it I moved on with my musical life (laughs) and then his Grammy's performance right I was watching it and I was just like what song is this that's so nice and like the beat is so traditional I'm going to use traditional, but I know there's a better word for it, but very traditional West African sounds in terms of the beat. And so I didn't know if that was the live interpretation, but I was like, this is such a yummy song. What song is this? Is it new? Has he released it? Discovered (laughs) that it was one of the songs that I claimed not to connect with. And so now I want to share it with you. So head over to the Show notes, I have a link to On Form by Burner Boy. I'm not too sure what it means, but there are bits where, you know, at the end of the chorus where he talks about, like, finally I'm on form. And I'm just, I I, I don't know, if I take it to be like a coming of age song, even though it's in a language that I don't understand, but that's where I connect with it. And yeah, I really like it. And I was also thinking that sometimes, like, when an artist releases an album sometimes we are not in the headspace to receive it so like i'll listen to an album and be like "Mm, i'm not sure 
and then go back to it months or even a year later and be like, what the heck? This thing is, it's like crack. I'm addicted. <laughs> Isn't it so interesting when that happens? Anyway, I'm going on a tangent, but you get what I mean. So let's jump into the story, which before we listen to it, I have a particular thought I want to share. So as you know, I'm a huge believer in healing. Whatever helps you heal, for me, it's therapy and a lot of mindfulness. I think you should tap into that. And not just any healing, intentional healing. I think the work I've done on myself in the last three to four years has been major. Oh my goodness. I feel like it's akin to building a house. Like, you know how treacherous that experience is and it's heavy you know you're digging and all of that I feel like that's the equivalent emotionally to the work I've done in the last three to four years and I'm very very proud of myself but what I do want to share is what I have found while healing from the things that I'm like oh I have a little crack here this part of me is completely broken this toxic cycle needs to be interrupted and erased. <laughs> you know, whatever it is that I was working on, what I found is a lot of the damage, the pain, the abandonment issues, etc., that we carry is from childhood, from a specific traumatic event, a physical move, an abusive environment, be it physical, emotional, whatever the case, words someone told you. You know, what is so crazy tenor for this last one is I maybe it's because I really love words which I've said on the podcast before but I remember every mean or harsh word I was told in childhood so for example when I was about 10 or 11 an aunt of mine and this was like after we moved in with her and another uncle because my mom had left my dad right so literally immediately moved in with them and my mom was pulling her weight right in the house and this aunt told me a uh, 9 10 11 year old go back to your father's people and I still remember her face when she said it I still remember what she was wearing what I was wearing like it's so vivid you think it happened yesterday and I remember years later telling her we have a rocky relationship. And I remember telling her, you know, I don't, I don't like you. And I, I think you don't like me. And I think you've done so much to me and the people that I care about. And you've never apologized. And then I gave, I cited this as an example. I'm like, you remember you told me A, B, C, D. And her response was, oh, but you were a child then. And I think that was when I remember letting go of any hopes of resolution for that relationship. Because... There can't be healing if there's no acknowledgement or like apology or etc. And so I kind of just let it go. But coming back to what I was saying is that a lot of the things we're trying to heal from, and I dare say all the things we're trying to heal from as adults are things that we experienced, we heard, were done to us, were told to us, happened around us when we were children. So then what I know is that... Children are full beings and we need to treat them as such, not these half empty things that are not seeing what we're doing and not hearing what we're saying and are not having an emotional response to all of these things happening. They are full beings and we need to treat them as such. And I say this with zero experience as a parent, but tons of experience as a child. <laughs> and in fact, I feel like we need to see children more, like truly see them. I hate that phrase of like, children are to be seen, not heard. No, when I say see, I mean like truly see this child as an individual, see their dreams, their behaviors, their desires, the things they're struggling with, the things they thrive at. Really, really hear them when they say things. Don't dismiss those things. And the reason I say they probably need to be seen more than let's say adults, is because we don't want to raise more damaged adults. And I think the story we'll hear over the next two weeks just reminded me of this. When I see children, I love children. Oh my goodness. Which is why sometimes I'm not fully convinced by my whole, oh, I don't want kids. 
even me internally. <laughs> there are times I'm not fully convinced by by my own words. I'm like, hey, chick. Because wherever I go and I, I stumble on kids, I will bend down to their level and I will play with children. It's always so just beautiful to hang out with children. They represent, I feel, the best parts of being a human, you know, before we get tarnished by capitalism and greed and all of these things. Whenever we travel or wherever we go around, if I see a kid, trust and believe, I've forgotten the story I'm telling you, I'm now figuring out how to play with a child and whatever. And I'm that person, even like in airports, I will babysit kids for, it's not really moms <laughs> who need a break, right? It's happened to me very many times and the kid will come to me and the mom will be like running after the kid and I'm just like, you know what, like take a breather here. Just let me tap in. You relax. And the most recent was a child who spoke only French. <laughs> but we made it work. We made it work. And, you know, this very special person in my life is always like, I I think you should, you should definitely have a child because you just love them so much. But anyway, I've gone on a tangent about my reproductive plans but <laughs> the story you will hear over the next two weeks is going to remind you of how precious kids are and how I think not only parents if you have access to any child maybe an aunt or a neighbor or whatever we need to do our part collectively of seeing kids and really just minimizing the amount of damage and harm they experience as children because we just want to save them from the lifetime of therapy that we are all facing as adults. You know what I mean? And so Tony, Tony Dungu, I interacted with his brilliant business mind on TikTok because he would share these little clips with tips, beautiful tips for business. And I remember finding a lot of valuable information that I could apply to my business from the things he was sharing. And I love that so much that I literally just like DM'd him. And I was like, please, you need to come on my podcast because I love the stuff that you're sharing. And so I thought we will have a story that is only about business. But, and I've shared this on this podcast before, the more I worked on myself and intentionally began healing, the more it had wonderful effects on my business. The two are not separate. And so uh, it was wonderful to walk that journey with Tony and have a story that's not only about business, but is really about the beginning of Tony, which is childhood. And what I didn't anticipate him sharing was he was sent to an approved school when he was just nine years old. A hundred African stories on Legally Clueless, stories from Africa. My name is Tony Domo. I was born and brought up in Nairobi, Kenya, and I love it here. The thing I love the most about my childhood was my inability to concentrate. I was never able to concentrate. I was one of those kids who, given an opportunity to do one thing and one thing only, I would go out of my way to do 10 things intentionally. So homework was, was a problem. School itself didn't make sense to me. Why am I spending 90% of my time in a building doing things with people I don't like the whole day, every day, five days a week? I, I hated the fact that kids needed to know stuff as a measure of their progress. I just wanted to experience stuff. So the funnest part of my childhood was doing stuff that my parents couldn't see when there were no adults around. And uh, I learned how you know, to climb up really tall trees and not fall down to my death. I learned how to ride bikes held together by nothing but like duct tape and toothpaste and faith. I created friends with people who normally would never be my friends, you know, like, helps and uh, guards and uh, newspaper delivery men and garbage men and um, when when I was when I really had free time I ran into a very large field that was next to my parents house and stayed there all day and looked for animals to you know try and cook which never succeeded I just enjoyed being in places I didn't understand and didn't know and my childhood was all about adventure and I loved adventure. Navigating the stress of being pushed back into books and boxes was my Achilles heel. I was never able to do it. Uh, somewhere on the interwebs, there's a video I did uh, on this Kenyan thing called Engage Talks. 
talking about my childhood and being sent to approved schools or unapproved school when I was nine because my parents figured out that or believed that I was uh, indisciplined, not you know, ADHD and dyslexia, one other thing at that time. And uh, it's, a, it's a long story because it was a year long for a nine-year-old, that's like a decade. And uh, approved schools are basically, for those who don't know, high discipline and high army-like educational institutions. And I spent a year there. Basically, it beat the lights out of my life. Growing up, that was a definitive, let's say, left turn that, that changed me as a person. And to this day, you know, that's, that's easily 35 years ago. Uh, and to this day, I still feel the ramifications of that. But then what I did get to learn is if you're going to be something, be something with everything you have, even if it takes everything from you and be it. So I decided when I got out of that school, thank God for moms, she came to school one time and I had tattooed Superman on my hand with a, with a branch, a small branch and a tw or a twig and scraped the word Superman for me to encourage myself to go through this pain that I was going to go through that I could do nothing about. And she, she said, it's time for us to leave. And so when I left, the ramifications of that carried on to my primary school years and my high school years. But what I, what I did get is that sense of resilience that if you are this person and you don't know how to be anybody else, trying to be somebody else is, is, uh, is a fail in and of itself. Just be who you are to the best of your ability. And, and that's what made me me. You know, that's, uh, that's how I've gotten as far as I've gotten. By just being aware of the fact that there is no box I was built for, except the one I create for myself. And that's the box I'm going to live in. Whenever people ask me if there's a specific experience that killed something specific in me, I can name 50 off the top of my mind. There are so many of them. Reliving them is very difficult because the little man in me has still never died in that way. But um, there's so many. I mean, being held by my throat on a wall five feet off the ground by a teacher 10 times my size, you know, being thrown across a room with completely no concern of where I land or how my head hits the ground, being woken up in the morning with a, whole, with a bucket of cold water poured over my bed, right? Um, I'm nine, you know, you, you, you're a child for crying out loud. Just seeing my mom on, on, on a visiting day because they'd come once a month and as she leaves, I cried and I walked past the teacher. Not, you know, you're supposed to stand when a teacher is walking past and I walked past the teacher because I was looking down and I was trying to hide my tears. And at, the teacher coming to the staff room in such a kind fashion, I was thinking, oh, he's, he's going to, you know, console me or something and slap me across the face so hard I, I couldn't hear on the left side for almost a month. It's, there's so many of those things that dehumanize you that when, when you leave the institution, you have a, a, a very twisted perception of what love looks like. And growing up, I've understood that I've just always thought I cannot just be loved for who I am. I have to be loved for what I give or what I have, right? And, you know, so many years later, those ramifications still show I think we look at children as assignments. We look at children as projects, as things we need to take care of, build, uh, mold, and create. Da, 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 da. And, and it's, it's not that we shouldn't, but everybody is that. It's just children are more. Children are people. They are their own people. They're creating their own experiences. They're learning the way they are learning. They're knowing what they, know, what they don't know. They'll ask for help. And if you can help them, help them. But stop making them assignments. Stop making them projects. Stop making them measures of your own failures or, or uh, proof that you can be a good parent. I have two children and my two daughters are really important to me, but they're not everything to me. They are not because I don't love them completely, because I have to let them go. I have to learn that you're going to learn your own experiences the best way you know how. I can put guardrails as a father and love you, you know, unconditionally, but then life is just going to show you that life has power over you more than I have power over you. And I shouldn't make you a project for me to showcase to my parents, your grandparents, or, or to my friends. You do you. I'll do me. I will love you because that's who I am. But in everything, your life's journey started the day you are cognitive that you exist and you can make a decision. And I will guide you as best as I can, but my responsibility is to love you. When I left the, the approved school, I never really did reintegrate into a normal school. I went to a nice school in Nairobi called St. Nicholas Primary School. It was amazing. Uh, but I had, a, I had a broken spirit. I had a it's called a weak gene. You, you look like you've been so violated that it's easy for other people to violate you. You never know how to stand up for yourself because you are not exactly in an environment where standing up for yourself was a survival tactic. And so I was bullied for the seven years that I was in primary school by boys and girls. And I created this narrative where if I just take it, it'll be okay. And I never really learned how to fight back into high school. The challenge with that is then you, your self-confidence is always shot, always, every single time. And it doesn't help when you're taller than everyone else. Because, yeah, I'm not a short guy. And it becomes very difficult to open yourself up to anyone because 
when you didn't know how to close yourself off from anyone because you were so young, you were abused and tattered. So when you get older, you, you, you keep less friends, you measure your words, you, whatever it is you're good at, you perfect because you want people to like you for what you can offer because you don't think people can just like you for who you are or love you for who you are. And it's taking a toll. It took a toll in primary school, it's taking a toll in high school, it's taking a toll in life. And a lot of these things are still things I'm processing as I grow. But the thing I love the most is you get so much more powerful when you're able to be emotionally intelligent. And that's one of the things I've really gotten out of this entire experience. I'm just so much more emotionally aware for myself and for the people around me. When I fail, I fail. There's no doubt. I do fail. Uh, but when I get it right, I get it very, very right. Because I know what it's like to be at the bottom of that totem pole that you're probably sitting at. And I kind of know how to get you out of that hole because I've been in it so many times. Whenever you're in a tough emotional situation, nothing, nothing beats survival mode. Like, do I need to get good grades to survive? Yes. Get good grades. Do I need to be good to this teacher to prevent getting a beating? Yes. Do that. Do I need to be good to these boys or these girls for them not to put nails on my seat or steal my stuff? Yes, be good to them. So I do all of those things, right? And one of the things you learn very quickly is the version of the world that you show and the version of yourself that you are are two totally different people. And as you get older with that, in, you know, in primary school and high school, you get to also see people wearing masks. You become very familiar with, you're a pretender, you're a fake, you know you don't know. And so I found myself having very, very, very few friends, sometimes one or two, but I found the best friends. They're really good people because I could see right through you. And growing older, <laughs> it's very interesting. I have used that skill to pick so many people in my life and know you're worth it. You're okay, but you're not worth it. You, on the other hand, you're worth it. And I will go an extra mile for you because I have seen who you are, I've seen what you are, and I know, I know you are worth it. And it's, it's, it's served me well. In high school, I find out, so when I was in primary school, I was really good as a student. Like, I was really good. Like, I was, like, top 10 in the province good. Like, I was sick good. So I went to a really good high school for, like, smart kids, like, Ivy League-type high school. These are the better ones in Nairobi. It's called, I mean, in Kenya, it's called Mamo. And there, I, the content was served to me very differently as it was in primary school. In primary school, it was very pictorial, very Oxford-type, you know, British system vibes. But in high school, it was typeset, which basically means it was typed by someone in the 70s, bound in a book that is very dusty and old, might eaten. Some pages have been chewed off by rats. And, and it was type font. I couldn't, for, the, the picture was drawn by a big biro. It was wild. And I started failing because my mind could not comprehend the content. I didn't know when I found out many years later that I was dyslexic and I was incapable of comprehending words and consuming them as learning material. It's three years into high school that my father said, you know, every time I see you listening to all these hip hop musics, you seem to hear one time and you remember them all. And he suggested, why don't you take a Sony Walkman, for those of you who don't know what that is, go research, and record your books onto the Sony Walkman on a cassette tape and listen back and see what happens. Because at this point I've failed so much, like anything goes, just anything goes. And for the first time in my high school, the headmaster accepted to allow me to listen to a Sony Walkman of my own pre-recorded books. And I moved from being an E student to a C student in three terms, which gave me a shot in life. Because when you get out of high school with anything below a C plus, you're not getting into university. And I got out of high school with that C plus. Like that's the minimum I needed, the bare minimum I, I, minimum I needed. But my experience with learning had stopped. I hated it. I hated it. I hated that I could, I could solve very complex problems in school, here's a small story. I did a course called Electricity, obviously, Electricity. And I created a, a circuit so complicated, students two years my senior couldn't recreate it, just visually. I just looked at it and I was like, yeah, this makes sense. I could do this, I could do that. And I put it together and I put it on the wall because you could do all this. It was like a Lego set type situation where you can just plug things in. And I created this super complicated circuit. No one could ever complete, like, how are you making those lights go on and not those lights? How are you doing this? How are you doing that with three switches and whatever? But if you ask me to draw it out and explain it, I couldn't because my mind couldn't interpret what I have done on paper. That was my life, and I hated it. When I got out of high school and my mom almost forced me to get into university, I knew the academic path was not for me. I knew it. I was like, I would die before I sit in an office as an auditor or an accountant or a lawyer or... I would rather just throw myself into the ocean. Like, I was just not going to do that. And it was now trying to figure out, also coming from a family of non-entrepreneurs, what's that life for? 
Tony looked like. From when I was a child, I knew I was an outcast. I was, I was an outlier. I was not the same. Whether it's a good thing, an outlier, or a bad thing, outcast, I just wasn't the same. I knew I just wasn't the same. People were reading Nancy Drews and, and all those famous fives and all of that. I just don't know what that was. Like, I was like, why am I reading? What for? I don't understand. This is a, was a waste of my time. When I got into uni, I spent 10 years there doing two degrees, international relations and journalism and diplomacy. Worked for the United Nations for six months, and I was like, I'm never going to go back. I just hated it. I was in a refugee camp, Kakuma and Dadab, for three months stints. And for the journalism, I out for a couple of radio stations, Nation, Kiss FM, KTN. And again, I hated that lifestyle. I was like, I cannot do this. Then one year in, I was like, no. And I was, I was really looking at the life of unemployed people. Like, I was like, I am not going to have a job. I'm going to do nothing. So might as well get comfortable trying to learn how to farm or something. And by happenstance, towards the end of my university career or my university experience when I was getting my second degree, both of which I've never picked out of uni, I, I bumped into this Dutch guy who was like introduced to me by another Dutch friend of mine. And he said, I want to start a computer hub. A what now? Like a cyber cafe? He said, no, 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 a tech hub where people come with their own laptops and we have a meeting of minds in technology. I did not know anything about it, but I was like, that sounds fun. Would you like a Kenyan to help you run it? And that was the beginning of what came to be known as the Nylab. And we did that in 2008. The idea came up. 2009, we built the office. And when I say we built it, I mean I was on hands and knees with a drill, with planks of wood, with nails, with nail guns, building the actual furniture for the room because it was a big room. And reaching out to people and telling them we have this space where if you're interested in technology, we do brainstorms, fireside chats, and, and the like. And you have to understand how crazy that was because in 2009, internet was still dial-up. <laughs> and people were like, dude, you to, to listen to it. I remember trying to listen to a Justin Timberlake song. Took an, a whole night to listen to it. Whole night wait, to, to buffer. If you young people don't know what the hell that is. And, and that's when we started. And everyone was like, Africa is never going to see the internet this, and have the booms and the busts of, of the valley or Silicon Valley or whatever. Uh, but we just believed. We believed in stupid nothing. Like we were just like, if it's going to happen, someone has to start it. And we started. And I remember Eric Hussman, who started the IAB, was across the hall. And he'd come and we'd sit down and laugh at how stupid we were and how crazy we were. But I do remember it was post-2007 when Kenya had terrible elections. And there was a lot of violence then. And so they had created something called Ushahidi that had gotten some attention globally. And people were like, oh, maybe there's something happening in Africa we should go see. And Kenya was a good nexus point. So that was a place where technology kind of started. Happenstance. No brilliance, just happenstance. And the Nylab was created, and three and a half years later, we closed the five and a half million euro round, and I said goodbye. Trying to navigate why I resigned and the thing that I hated about my job comes down to footsteps. And so practical. Footsteps. I hated seeing the path on which my footsteps had been on the day before. I didn't believe that I was created into a planet this big to walk over my footsteps again. I didn't understand why earning a living and having an adventure were different. I didn't understand why I had to do the same thing over and over again for it to mean something to me. I didn't get it. I really, honestly, to this day, I still don't understand it. Why are we so attached to labels? Remember, I hated labels. I hated labels because every label I was, I was attached to was a negative label. An indisciplined child, all over the place person, incapable of concentrating. Like all the labels I had were negative labels because of the way I was built. And I knew I didn't build myself. Somebody else put me in here this way. It wasn't me. So I never once thought a lawyer, an architect, a doctor, a pilot was a label I wanted to keep. I hated those labels. I wanted to be a person. I wanted to be a person who has an adventure, who lives, who sees everything. I just couldn't for the life of me understand why I wanted to do that in somebody else's office. So for me, leaving a job isn't leaving the job as if the job is the value. It's more like being job free, getting away from that. And not to say that I don't understand and appreciate the power of the things that people do in the world. It's just, I'm just not going to be controlled by that thing. I'm not going to be defined by it. It could be what I do. I do something. I'm an entrepreneur. That's a title. But my life is the thing I want to celebrate. I want to enjoy it. I want to, I want to live it. And it's been a journey getting there. But I'm so much more comfortable being able to define who I am than being defined for by someone else or a position that gives me a certain amount of money, which is the other thing I've come to learn that 
it's it's just not always about how much you get or how much you have. It's about how much of you there is left. And as you know, as we all know, there's a lot of people with so many things, but very little of themselves left. And I don't see the point of that. Let me tell you something. The, the, the rot in our society, I blame half of it on the work we do. How many people walk in and walk out of an office feeling meaningful? How many people? And it's a core function of life. It's, it's so important for you to feel wanted, needed, appreciated, respected. But it's also very important for you to feel like you're giving, you're, you're growing, you're, you're thriving, you're, you're making a difference. What difference can you be making in an auditing firm? For crying out loud, like truly tell me, right? I used to work in radio and I'd see all these guys coming to the radio station and they'd talk about all these vices because we listen to that stuff. We like hearing all the bad things. Oh, so-and-so did this to so-and-so and so-and-so -so stabbed so-and-so and oh my God, have you seen this thing? And, and it's, you've been doing gossip for 20 years. It rots your soul. Like if I had the chance to talk to one person, I would tell them something good. How much more should you be telling them good things if you have 400,000, 4 million people listening to you every morning. But no, you choose to go the easy route. You choose to be the pain in the ass. You choose to talk about all the negative things. You create a narrative for everybody in every bus, every car, every hotel room, every barbershop, every elevator of how life is horrible. And then you expect those people to come out into the world and be good people. You can't poison plants and expect good fruits. It just doesn't work that way. And I, I saw that and I was like, I cannot be part of this establishment. This whole establishment is that. So media, shut it down. Went to work for the UN and it was the same thing. Like there was no difference. You know, you're paying us ridiculous amounts to be in refugee camps where people have been wearing the same clothes for eight months. They're, they're eating in plastic plates that barely can hold them up. They live in tents so derelict. The goal is to just make sure the UN logo is visible, right? You don't actually, it's, you don't care for them. But the amount of money we are getting paid in dollars at 21 to be in the lab for three months, I think I bought my parents' cars. Like, and, and so I'm like, this, this makes, who are we serving? Them or us? And that was around the time UNHCR had this huge breakout uh, sexual assaults and cases. It was a global situation. And that's when I said, okay, here's another establishment I don't want to work in or participate in. And... Now, looking at what I have, looking at what I've done, I'm grateful I made those decisions because I am who I am. I like me. I'm not there yet, but I like me. Catch more African stories in the next episode of Legally Clueless. That is just part one of Tony's story, and it's already so super, super inspiring, right? So next week, part two will be shared. So make sure you're here on Monday to receive it. But in the meantime, I'll put a link to Tony's TikTok so you can connect with him there. Oh, just the wonderful stuff that he shares. I just really love how he had such a deep understanding of self from such a young age and understanding of how his mind operates, etc., etc. You see, this is why I come back to really listen and see children because they know. <laughs> they know what's going on in their heads or how they are thinking, etc. Yeah, it's just it's wonderful. The story is, is, is wonderful to just hear the importance of actually listening and seeing children. So next week, we'll get into part two and then we'll chumbo the story a bit more. Sandero. However, if the platform you are streaming this on allows you to drop a comment, please do. I want to send love to everybody who drops comments on our Spotify page. I really do appreciate you guys. And don't forget to catch this podcast on Trace across East Africa. Monday and Wednesday is 1 p.m. and 11 p.m. and Fridays with it at 1 p.m. You can also head over to our show notes. <laughs> If you want to share your brilliant African story with us, just fill out the storyteller form and we will hook you up with one of our correspondents. It doesn't matter where in the world you are. We will record your story. You're African. We want to hear it. It's valid. Thank you so much for listening to this episode to the very end. I'm sending you so much love. And yeah, share, share, share this specific episode with all parents you know or aunties, etc. Anybody who has access to a child needs to hear this so that we can start having a bit less damaged adults that's it for this episode of legally clueless you can share this podcast with your friends you can keep it for yourself i'm not judging just make sure you're here next week for the next episode <laughs>